You are listening to the emergency broadcast systems. This station broadcasts emergency news and official information on the air for a sign area. There are quite a few of us in the amateur radio community today who are very fond of portable communications. That might be parks on the air, islands on the air, summits on the air, or some sort of HF pack activity. Others, like myself, may enjoy extended field communications operating for days at a time in a faraway place out in the field. Now, regardless of the type of portable communications we're talking about, there's always going to be some sort of enabler which allows us to achieve our portable communications goals. Quite a few of you have been asking questions about the solar-powered field station. I don't mean the communications gear. I mean the shelter, the heating, how I prepare my food, all of the things that go into actually supporting the solar-powered field station when it's out in the field. So today we're going to take a look at one of the kits I put together, which is based on the Nortent TP4. It's an ultra lightweight system that I've talked about on the blog, but I haven't actually made a video about it other than being deployed with it in the field. Now, I primarily use the TP4 in the springtime, in the summer, and in the autumn, although it is a four season tent and it can be deployed in the winter. The TP4 is actually ultra lightweight and modular. You can deploy it with the ground sheet, with the inner tent, with the titanium wood stove, or simply with the fly sheet if you want to. This is why it's my go to ultra portable shelter system for the field. Now, I primarily use the TP4 with a titanium wood stove. Now, the reason we use titanium is because operating man portable whether skiing or hiking or even riding a bicycle, we are limited by our load carrying capabilities. So we combine the lightweight capabilities of a seal nylon teepee with the ultra lightweight wood stove made of titanium for a man portable option. So we're not just using the titanium wood stove for heating the shelter, we also use it to prevent condensation inside the shelter and on our gear. And of course, we also use a titanium wood stove for cooking, making coffee or tea, or of course, boiling water. In practice, there's three different components we use for managing condensation inside the tent and providing heat. That's the inner tent, the titanium wood stove, and the fly sheet. Essentially, we're trying to create a barrier between nature, the weather, the moisture, the bugs, or anything else which could cause discomfort, as well as protect our gear and keep the radio operator as comfortable as possible during this off-grid excursion. Now, I do understand some of you may be thinking, wow, this is entirely too much gear to carry, but this is no different than some other type of shelter. In fact, I don't necessarily disagree with you. My point is, we need to pick a shelter system which is adequate for the conditions we're operating in. I'm at 65 degrees north, just south of the Arctic Circle. With the exception of summertime, all of my equipment is going to take a beating. So of course, winter's obvious, but autumn and spring are almost as harsh or even more so than many other places around the world during their winter. So as I said earlier, it's important for us to ensure our equipment is safe and the operator remains as comfortable as possible during this off-grid excursion. So let's take a moment now to talk about cooking gear. I spend an awful lot of time counting ounces and grams for field communications. So to reduce my loadout, I like to use titanium cookware. The brand I found is called Lixada, and I found them from Amazon. I'll leave a link to them in the description. Now, I really enjoy boiling water with the titanium pots. However, the fry pan has a problem. Food often sticks to the fry pan, and it's incredibly difficult to get it off in the field. So I'm really wondering if I should just go back to using a traditional cast iron skillet or fry pan 
as opposed to the titanium one. Of course, there are a couple of different alternatives, perhaps carrying oil to cook with, or actually seasoning the titanium fry pan. That's one option. What do you think about that? But obviously, I'm very fond of the titanium because of the weight savings, but uh, we'll need to come up with something, perhaps the traditional cast iron fry pan. Now, I do have another cook system, and that's the Jet Boil Zip. It's ultra lightweight and extremely fast at boiling water. Now, I'm using the Jet Boil Zip when it's not possible to deploy the wood stove. The only problem with it is it doesn't work very well at below freezing temperatures. So when I'm using the jet boil, I use it with dehydrated meals. The meals are actually quite lightweight and only require boiled water to prepare them. So we can definitely call this my high speed low drag cooking system. But of course, if you run out of the gas canisters that power it, you're kind of out of luck. Still, that's just a matter of planning. Now, honestly, my preference is always going to be utilizing a wood stove or a firebox, something like that, so that we can use whatever fuel we find on site. Even so, I think from a preparedness perspective, each and every one of us should have a jet boil for a quick and easy way to boil water. The reason I say this is the jet boil is the only system I know that is capable of boiling a pot of water in under three minutes. Now there's definitely a lesson here and I've had mine. Needing to get some food in me, something warm in me uh, during a severe case of hypothermia and then needing to do that quickly. So the jet boil saved the day. Perhaps now is a good time to talk about our sleep systems, that is, mine and Snapper's. At the moment, I'm using a surplus bag from the Finnish Army. It's the M05 version. The sleeping bag is made by Corinthia in Austria. This model has a double layer of G-loft hollow fiber filling allowing it to be used down to some pretty extreme temperatures. Now it's designed to allow you to sleep comfortably at minus 15 Celsius or down to five Fahrenheit or in extreme conditions, minus 38 Celsius or minus 36.4 Fahrenheit. So honestly, I think if it's good enough for the Finnish army, it's definitely good enough for my expeditions. This is the same sleeping bag you've seen me deployed with in the summer as well as all of the Arctic Circle expeditions with both of my shelters. Now, admittedly, it's probably heavier than I would like it to be. But honestly, it's got better performance than any other sleeping bag I've deployed with. And this is true also in wintertime above the Arctic Circle. So I suppose the bottom line is, I know I can find something cheaper. I know I can find a sleeping bag which is lighter. What I don't know, however, is if those solutions would work as well as this one has for the past few years. As always, I'll try to reduce weight in other places so that I can maintain this level of comfort and safety with equipment like this. Now, Snapper can sleep almost anywhere. We've got her a lightweight hiking blanket we use to throw down on the shelter floor. We put spruce tree branches underneath it, and uh, she sleeps pretty well. Unfortunately, on this last trip to Lapland, we had some overnight temperatures which were below zero. I woke up to her shivering there inside the shelter because I didn't wake up to add some wood to our titanium stove. Now, it didn't take very long for her to figure out she needs to stay as close to that stove as possible. And it didn't take very much time for me to figure out she needs her own sleeping bag. This is because she spends most of her time just hanging around the shelter. She's not running around or doing active things. But just so she doesn't think she's going to freeze to death and uh, so we can both get a good night's sleep, we're going to invest in a 
dog hiking sleeping bag. It's another lightweight sleeping bag uh, just for Snapper. Now there's one more piece of equipment that's pretty important and of course that's my backpack. Now you see I'm carrying a lot less gear or at least gear which packs a lot smaller than I have in previous years. Now really, you probably don't notice this uh, when watching the channel, but the gear, the equipment, everything I carry, it's in a constant state of flux. It's always changing, it's always being updated, and it's always being improved. But for this last piece of kit I'm going to show you, I've decided to go old school. So my backpack is a surplus backpack from the Netherlands. It's called the Low Alpine Sting Rucksack, and it's in DPM colors. Now it has a load capacity of 70 liters, an internal frame, and it's also Molly compatible. Now it's definitely not the lightest backpack one could carry. It's definitely not the best backpack one could carry, but it's relatively comfortable. It's modular, and you can beat the absolute heck out of it without worrying if it's going to survive the trip or not. Now I've started off with ultralight backpacks and then moved to expedition backpacks but found both of them a bit one-sided. I mean they were tailored for one specific goal and that doesn't necessarily always work for me. So I decided to go back to a military backpack. However, I wanted to go to one which was a mountaineering backpack designed for the military. That's worked out pretty well so far. So let's finalize this video in this way, guys. We often have an unrealistic expectation of doing field communications, but not considering the equipment or the supporting equipment involved with carrying that out. Our radio equipment may be a large percentage of the equation, but our camp, our sleeping gear, our cooking gear, how we filter water, all of these things have to be considered for a successful extended field communications deployment. It really doesn't matter whether you're in the field for emergency communications, for preparedness, or for disaster relief, or even anything else. If there's no logistics infrastructure to support us, we need to be completely self-reliant in the field. That's what this video has been all about. Now, one of my subscribers told me radio is about 75% of the equation with 25% being everything else. And we hardly ever talk about the everything else. Let me know if you agree or if you have a completely different opinion. I'd like to hear it in the comments.